As Christians, we are so grounded in the New Testament and the New Covenant. It's easy for us to overlook the saints of the Old Testament, like Noah, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Ezekiel, and many others, when we're considering examples of faith to emulate. But the fact is, the heroic example of Old Testament saints deserve much more attention than they usually get. So too the people of Israel, when they were zealous for the Lord. And while it's often true that the people of Israel did quite often stray from the Lord, that's hardly a unique characteristic of the Israelites. Given our culture and society, we of all people cannot be pointing fingers at anyone on that account. But tonight I'd like to look at an instance when Israel as a people were on fire for the Lord from the Old Testament book of Ezra. Now Ezra was a priest who traced his lineage all the way back to Aaron, Moses' brother. Ezra was among the remnant of Israel who had been exiled to Babylon after Jerusalem had been destroyed and who, after many decades, had been allowed to return to Judah to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. After the wall protecting the city had been rebuilt, Ezra read to the people from daybreak to midday from the book of Moses. That is, Ezra read to them from the law of God. The beauty and significance of this event is how attentive and eager the people were to hear the law of the Lord. They had returned from a 70-year exile, and while Jerusalem was still largely in ruins all around them, they were finally able to hear the word of God after years of being deprived of it in Babylon. The scriptures were read to them for hours and hours, but it seemed like a few minutes to them. So thirsty were they for the word. But don't get the idea that they were hearing things that were always pleasant. It wasn't something akin at all to the health and wealth gospel so favored by TV evangelists today. They heard the entirety of the law of God, the blessings for obeying and the just punishments for disobedience. And though they loved and respected Ezra, they hadn't come to hear what Ezra had to say. They wanted to hear what God had to say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They knew that the word of God was life. And if God's word said they must change their way of life, even radically, if the word said they would be punished for past sins and transgressions, so be it. The years of suffering at the hands of their captors had given them a laser focus. Their one desire was to do whatever they needed to get back right with God. And after hearing the word of God, all of Israel started weeping, not because they learned what punishments they were subject to because they had failed to keep their laws and precepts while they were in Babylon, but rather because they had offended God, because they had sinned, albeit unwittingly. You see, their hearts were directed to God, not themselves. They didn't ask, is God mad at us, or will we be punished, but rather, What have we done? And is this the way we repay God after all he has done for us? Do you see the change in focus? This kind of focus directed towards God 
is 180 degrees out from our culture's focus, a focus that is solely on me, me, and once again, me. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that living in this culture of ours doesn't affect our attitudes and perspectives. It would be a miracle if it didn't. For so many in our culture spend all their time blaming someone else for their troubles and excusing themselves for any fault or sin, if you can find someone who admits they have any faults or sins. And by the way, have you ever wondered just who's causing all this trouble if no one has any faults or sins? And of that small minority who dare to admit they have some, how often is their attitude that it's no big deal because God will forgive them? We need to honestly examine our lives to ensure such attitudes, however muted, don't creep into our relationship with God, who is to be the first in all things in our lives. But what would a focus that put God first look like? Well, for one thing, we would have the following priorities. God first, family second, neighbor third, and ourselves last. Me is pretty far down on the list, and rightly so. Our faith in our parish would be the center of gravity of our lives. Not that every activity in our lives would be at or even connected necessarily with the parish, but rather all our activities, decisions, and choices would flow, would be a natural consequence of living out our faith. And speaking of living out our faith, that would be paramount for us. Anything conflicting with the faith would be decided in favor of the moral and ethical principles and priorities we've been taught by the church. And if putting family first or refusing to do something unethical at work meant the loss of a job or promotion, so be it. We would know that everything would be okay because we can rely on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Businesses and schools we owned or ran would have the same priorities. Prayer would be a primary focus for us. Living the Beatitudes that our Lord taught us would be our goal, and we would strive to make that our most natural response. Sharing the faith, too, would be an integral part of our lives. Though, frankly, that would come for free because living out our lives with our priorities 180 degrees out of phase with, with society would certainly not go unnoticed. When we failed or stumbled while trying to live out our faith like the Israelites, our sorrow would not flow from pride, self-pity, or fear. It would flow from love. It would be the sorrow of a child who knew he or she had disappointed their parents but still never doubted their continuing love and mercy. It would be a sorrow that leads to a firm resolve to avail ourselves again of the many graces God provides, one that ever trusts in his forgiveness. It would be a sorrow that leads to praise and thanksgiving for having such a loving Father, our Father in heaven. You see, on earth, our perfection consists in the striving. Our perfection consists in the striving. Whether we become a saint before we die is ultimately God's affair, not ours. Our perfection lies in staying the course, in getting up when we fall, in refusing to give up. Our perfection lies in never taking our eyes off the Lord.